Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you out this morning. I know how much uh, many of you love our politicians. We're to love every man and pray for every man, but I have a politician joke for you. It says that a busload of <clears throat> politicians were, were driving down the road, down a country road, when all of a sudden the bus ran off the road and crashed into a tree, into an old farmer's field. Well, the old farmer, after seeing what had happened, he went over to investigate. He didn't call 911. He just went over to investigate. He then proceeded to dig a hole to bury the politicians. A few days later, the local sheriff came out, and he saw the crashed bus, and, and he asked the old farmer where all the politicians had gone. The old farmer said that, uh, he said, I buried them. And the sheriff asked the old farmer, he says, well, were they all dead? The old farmer replied, well, some of them said they weren't, but you know how politicians lie. So, <laughs> oh, man, we love our politicians. <laughs> well, this morning I want to continue. We are just about done with this book in Timothy. And uh, uh, in fact, we won't finish this week, but we will finish next week, Lord willing. Uh, but we are in 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning. And we're going to begin in verse 11 and uh, go through verse 16. Now, we read the first 10 verses last week, and what I would like to do is I'd like to read from verse 1 through verse 16 this morning. The title of the message, if you take notes, uh, is a challenge for believers or a challenge for Christians. Paul says, writing this letter to Timothy, who was the pastor of this church at Ephesus, he says, in chapter 6, verse 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Those who have unbelieving masters count their masters worthy of all honor. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved and they're partakers of the same benefit that, that you are. These things teach and exhort, Timothy. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud. He knows nothing. But doting about questions and strifes of words, or wars of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. But godliness, he says, with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And here's why for the love of money. The love of money is a root of all evil, or the root of all evil. It's actually a root of all kinds of evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith, and they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, here's where we're picking up today. Here's the contrast. Here's the exhortation for us today. But thou, O man of God, it says, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing or the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, when it's his time, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can we, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, Paul giving us another exhortation 
here. We have moved through lots of things here in 1 Timothy regarding the church and its behavior, how it's supposed to operate, how it's supposed to function. And he kind of ends the exhortation. Last week we read it. He kind of ends the exhortation, and he says that anyone who, who, who teaches contrary to wholesome or healthy words of Christ, he says, he says their philosophy is not based on healthy teaching. He says uh, it doesn't produce godliness. And Paul warns of these men, and he tells Timothy, and he tells the church at Ephesus that when you encounter those people, you are to withdraw yourself continually with present imperative. It means present means yes, or it must continually happen. Imperative means it's not a suggestion, it's a command. You must continually withdraw yourself from these types of people. And he says those who teach such he says, he says, like it's it's in verse nine there. He says, he said, those who teach stuff, he says, it's, it's, they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which those things drown men in destruction and perdition. And then he goes into verse eleven here in our text. He says, but you want to be a man of God. Anyone this morning? Anyone? couple of you. Well, that's good. That's really, it's good. We're growing. Look, I didn't write this, you know. Now, this is God's word. Take it, take it up with him. Look at what he says in verse 11. But thou, the thou, talking to me, talking to you, the thou is emphatic. It's emphatic. And it sets our contrast. But thou. And, and here's what it means. And you as for yourself. And you as for yourself. In contrast to what I've just said. O thou man of God. Flee these things. Follow after these things. Verse 11. But thou O man of God. Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Thou, O oh man of God. Now, we just read that and say, well, he's talking to people who, who want to be godly men. Well, let me just tell you something. That would have meant something to Timothy. That was very important to this young man, Timothy. If you look back in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you look at verse 14 and verse 15, I want to show you why this is important to the man that Paul was writing to. And it's important to us, too but specifically Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child, Timothy, he's talking to Timothy, that from a child, Timothy, you hast known the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament. And they were able, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Timothy knew the Old Testament. He was taught by his mother. He was taught by his grandmother, the Old Testament scriptures. Thou, O man of God, is a phrase that is used sparingly in the New Testament. Sparingly. Primarily in the Old Testament to describe the prophets. And so for Timothy, who was grounded in his Judaism, his understanding of, of Judaism, for him to hear, O oh, thou man of God, that would have been a heavy thing for Timothy to listen to, to hear, to read. That would have been weighty for him. And he's the last man in the New Testament. He's the last man in the Bible that that phrase is attributed to. Timothy, O oh, thou man of God. And so Timothy reads this, <laughs> verse 11. But thou, O oh, man of God. And there's no doubt in my mind that Timothy's thinking, oh, Moses, Ab Abraham, Elisha, Elijah. Daniel, the prophets. 
And, and the first thing he reads about this, O oh, thou man of God, the first thing he reads in verse 11 is run. <laughs> I mean, you would think, you know, O oh, thou man of God, the first thing you would hear is fight, stand up. No, nope, first thing he hears is run. But thou, O oh, man of God, flee these things. Flee. O oh, man of God, flee. And it gives us the idea of this church that you are to run like you are running away from your enemy because you are. You are. You're running away from your enemy. You're running for your life. That's because we are. These things, he says in the verses, verses prior, are, are the things that drown men in destruction and perdition. Because, he says in verse 10, you fall into temptation. Many have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Look, he says this, people who make monetary, material gain, people who make worshiping mammon the focus of their life, here's what they have to figure out. If that is the central theme of your life, you're going to figure out that you have to compromise somewhere in life. Because here's what you're going to say. Well, I'll take a little bit of money under the table. I, 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 you're going to compromise. I'll take a little bit of money under the table. You know what I'll do? I'll create this account so the IRS doesn't know about it. Or we compromise like this. Or, you know, I, I don't drink alcohol, but... I'm going to hobnob with those people so that I get my promotion. And what that creates is an atmosphere where worldly, where the flesh thrives and flourishes and it blurs and rounds off all the edges, okay? And where Christians or where believers are not at home at all. And they can get pulled down and sucked into that world. And Paul warns of it here. He says, O oh, thou man of God, flee these things. And listen, I'm going to say this again. As we move through this text this morning, there are three present imperatives. And you say, that may not be a big deal, but you should be getting the gist of this by now over all the years as I've been mentioning these things. Present imperatives. There are three of them. And there's one eritist imperative. Three present imperatives, one eritist imperative. Present means must continually happen. Must continually happen. Imperative is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's something you must continually do. So the present imperatives that we've read here in verse 11 are you must continually flee. That's it. You must continually run like you're being chased by your enemy, like you're running for your life. You must continually flee. But you must also, and we're going to talk about this, you must also continually follow after. The other present imperative there is in verse 12. Fight, the good fight. You must continually fight. And then he says in verse 12, here's the eridist imperative, lay hold on eternal life. Eritist imperative. You must do this. It's an imperative. You must do this. Eritist is once and for all. Lay a hold of eternal life, Timothy. Lay a hold of. So, so you must, here it is. So you must continually run like, like, like the enemy is chasing you. And it's because he really is. There's an unseen operator in the world today. And you can't run away from him one time, and the next day it's gone. You can't do that. You know what the problem with us is? I'll tell you the problem with me is this. We like to flee just enough to give the impression that we're fleeing, but we want to stand close enough to keep our eyes on it. We want to stand close enough to keep our eyes on it. 
So he says, oh, thou man of God, you want to be a man of God? Flee these things. And here's the second part of this. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Here's, here's the second part. We must continually pursue. We're, we're, we are continually running away from something, fleeing. And now we are continually running after something to take hold of it. And here are the three couplets I want to look at here this morning. Verse 11, three couplets. Verse 11, and follow after, must continually pursue, continually follow after righteousness and godliness, faith and love, patience and meekness. First pair, righteousness and godliness. Righteousness here, in, in our text here, as we're reading this this morning, righteousness is not the same righteousness that you had, that Romans tells us that we have imputed to us by the blood of Christ. When we become believers, the Bible says that we are right. We get his righteousness. But that's imputed to you and I. That's, that's given to us. This righteousness that Paul's talking about here in verse 12 is something that's lived out. It's lived out. Keep your finger there. And I love this verse. Paul, the same author, wrote to the Philippian church, and he gives us just a wonderful picture of this righteousness in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 12 and in verse 13. He says, Wherefore... My beloved, as you have always, look here, have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's talking to the Philippian church. Uh, he's, he's talking to you and I that, that we have salvation and we are to work it out. But look here. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what we have in Christ Jesus, God does, it, does everything he needs to do on the inside of us so that we have the ability through him to work it out. And that's the righteousness that Paul is talking about here in verse 11. Righteousness. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, there should be a living out of that. There should be a demonstration of that in your life. So you continually flee this, and you, con you continually pursue after righteousness. Now, righteousness is the horizontal. This way. We have a Sunday school class going on downstairs called The Horizontal Jesus by Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans. And he talks a lot about the Christian, the horizontal life, living this way. And that's righteousness, living horizontally. Now, the second word there in our first couplet is godliness. Verse 11, that's the vertical. Okay, that's the vertical. The righteousness is the horizontal, the godliness is, is the vertical. It, 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 means, it means piety. <laughs> we, we have a new nature. Paul tells us that, that we are given a new nature. We are a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And be, because of our vertical. And it's different from the nature of this world. Talk to somebody who has been a Christian a long time. Talk to someone who is older, who has been a Christian for 50, 60 years of their life, who has more days behind them than they do in front of them. And listen to the wisdom and the maturity and the longing of their heart as they long to go home, as they long for the things of heaven. And, and, and they do not, they, they no longer look at the things of the world. They don't dominate their life anymore. I believe that's what he's talking about here. This godliness, this, this vertical. So, so we're to flee this, continually run to righteousness, which, which is a living out of our faith to this, to this piety or godliness that demonstrates that we are in communion with a living God. Now the second set of couplets are this. Faith and love. 
Faith and love. Faith, or more properly, faithfulness. And faithfulness is this, a demonstration of someone's character. That's what faithfulness is. A demonstration of someone's character. Faith and love. Love, agape, or divine love. Listen, and you've heard this here in this church for a number of years, that agape, love, is a supernatural order. That comes from God. Supernatural order. But I want you to know this too. It's also a decision. It's also a decision because many times I do not feel like agapeing people. I don't feel like agapeing people. Our feelings can betray us. Our feelings can betray us. And so it's a decision. Our feelings, one commentator wrote this, our feelings are subservient to right choices. Truth is greater than emotion. And I know people don't like to hear that. Many times you have to love someone who is unlovable. And the only kind of love that you can love them with is a supernatural love. And that's Christ loving through you. That's it. And so it's a decision. It's a behavior you lived out. Faithfulness and, and love. A demonstration of character. A decision to love. A decision to allow Christ to love through you because you can't love the way he tells us to love. And then the third couplet he tells us to, is, is this. The first couplet that we are to flee after <clears throat> or, or, or to pursue after is patience and meekness. So, so you got righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and now patience and meekness. And I want you to know this. I don't like those words. I don't like them. Patience. You, you, <laughs> patience. Hoopamoni. There's going to be a test next week. You've heard patience a lot over the last five years. You heard the Greek word for patience, hoopamoni. Hoopamoni. It means this, having the ability to bear up under the pressure. I've used this example. You're standing by the bus. It's cold outside. You're waiting for the bus. The bus is an hour late. That's not what it's talking about. You're standing by the bus stop. The bus is late. It's cold outside. It's raining outside. You're waiting for the bus. And a truck goes by and splashes you with water. That's hoopamoni. To bear up under the pressure. It, it speaks of steadfastness. It's sometimes, can I, sometimes in life things are very, very, very painful, aren't they? And Paul says we need to flee after and take hold of, of these virtues where, where we can bear up under whatever that pressure is. Meekness. Meekness. You know how you define meekness? Meekness is made up of two words. Here it is. Me, ek. You're supposed to laugh. Me, ek. Meek. Me, ek. Two words. Should help you understand a little bit better. Don't think too much of yourselves more than you should. Jesus, the only autobiographical statement that he makes about himself in all four Gospels is in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Take a look at that in your, in your Bibles here. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Jesus says, this, this is, I am meek. I am lowly in heart. Here is, listen, here is the King of Kings. Here is the Lord of Lord. He comes to earth. He, he puts on human skin. Paul tells us in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Look here. 
but made himself of no reputation and, and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Meek, me, ek. Jesus says, I became meek and lowly at heart. He emptied himself. And do you know something? The amount of power and the amount of majesty it took for him to do that is incomprehensible. Meekness is not weakness. One pastor said years ago, it's strength under control. It's strength under control. And these are the things that you and I, as believers, are to constantly, continually run after to take hold of. Now, Paul, okay, the fleeing process, and then the running to, continue, continually flee these things, continually run to these things, he defines the process for us here and lets us know what it's like. Look at verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. He defines it. He defines this process of fleeing from and running to continually. He defines it. Fight. Do you see the word fight twice in the first sentence? It's there. They both have different meanings. The first fight means to, it's agonizo. Can you imagine where we get our English word, agonize? And the second one is agon, from the first word. And here's the idea of this, fight the good fight. The idea is that you have to enter into a contest. Here, by the way, it's present imperative. Present means what? You must continually do this. Imperative is not a what? Suggestion. It is a command. It is present imperative. You must continually fight, enter into this contest. And so you have got to continually enter the fight. And once you continually enter into the fight, when you're in there, you got to fight. You can't stand on the sideline. You got to be engaged in the fight, he says. And I believe Paul, when he wrote this, understood the importance of this. He's from Tarsus. Tarsus was the epicenter of, of their, their our modern day Olympic Games. This is where they played all their games. Paul wasn't permitted, Saul at that time, wasn't permitted to participate in those games because of his religion. He was a Judy, Judaizer. They sacrificed a meat to the, all their gods. Paul couldn't participate. But I guarantee you, in knowing how zealous the apostle Paul was, I can tell you this, he's very competitive. And I guarantee you, he stood on the sideline and said, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that better than you. I can do that. In the boxing ring, in these games that they had, the boxers, they wore gloves. They were lined with fur from the animals that, that, that they kill. But the gloves, listen, this is important. The gloves had shards of metal on them and pieces of bone on them. And guess what? If you got punched with one of those, you got messed up. The wrestlers, when they were done with their wrestling matches, if they lost the wrestling match, they had their eyes gouged out. They had their eyes gouged out. Now we go, ooh, but listen, that's the world. That's the world. Paul said, this is the fight, man. This is it. And if we enter the fight and we are not engaged to win, Paul says, we can lose. And we can lose our sight. And we take our eyes off of 
We get them gouged out by the world and we take our eyes off the one who matters. When everything around us in our life, when all the dust settles and everything, everything gets back to, quote unquote, a sense of normalcy. And we come to our senses and we say, what happened to me? What happened to me? How, how did I get here? How did I end up doing that? We lose our way. We lose our perspective. Like those wrestlers who had their eyes ripped out, they can't see. Paul says this. You want to be a man or woman of God? Here's the prescription. There are things you need to run away from. Like you're running away from your enemy. Like you're running for your life. Things of selfishness. Things of ungodliness. He says here, after money and material possessions, bowing to different gods. Things that would suck us down and drown men in destruction and perdition. Run away, Paul says. Flee. Not just one time. Every day, continually. But if you're running away and you're fleeing continually, you need to be running after something else in order to take a hold of that, he says. And that's righteousness, that's godliness, that's faith, that's love, that's patience, that meekness. And if you do that, if you're fleeing these things and you're constantly running to these things, then you're in the fight. You're in the good fight. It's a struggle. Agonize, oh. You're fighting the good fight. Now I want to tell you something. Paul is not just giving Timothy some empty advice. Paul is not just giving Timothy a pat on the back for some encouragement. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And look at verse 6 to 8. These aren't just empty words. These aren't just things that Paul, you know, laying in bed one night and thinking of that he could say to encourage Timothy. He lived it. He says, for I am now ready. Ready for what? To be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I'm getting ready to die. He says, I have fought the good fight, a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul signs off and he says, my course is done. He says, I got in there and I fought. I didn't get my eyes plucked out, but I fought. I fought. So Paul wasn't just giving Timothy empty advice at all. And then he adds something to that. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, Timothy. You got to fight it. You got to get in there. And once you're in there, you got to get engaged in the battle. But he adds something. He says, lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. Timothy, once you're in this battle, then you must once and for all, you must once and for all lay hold of eternal life. Timothy, whereunto you were called. Eternal life. Hey, I, I, I know most of you, if not all of you, know this Bible verse. Mark, don't put it up on the screen. John 3, 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Go ahead and put it up there, Mark. See that? Shall not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you are a believer here, if you're a Christian, if you're watching live by way of the internet this morning, and you have given your life to Christ, 
right now, you have eternal life. You have it. See, it says that. But have everlasting life. You have it. When you die and you cross over, that's not when you get it. You get it now when you receive Christ as your Savior. You have eternal life. Once, once you've been regenerated, once that regeneration takes place, you have eternal life. And he says here in verse 12 of our text, lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. Take hold of that right now, Timothy. Take hold of that right now, Beavertown Bible Church, and allow it to determine how you live your life. Because our life is otherworldly. Do you believe that? You say, well, no, I'm, I'm from Earth. Where, where are you from, Jupiter? Mars? You're from the crazy planet? You keep talking about the mothership coming out here. Where are you really from? Our life, listen, our life is otherworldly. You ain't staying here. It's otherworldly. It's from somewhere else. Jesus himself said this in John 17, verse 16. He said to God, his Father, he said, They are not of the world. Cosmos. Even as I am not of the world, we are not, our, our, our life is otherworldly. It's, it's from somewhere else. The writer of Hebrews, I love what he said. He's talking about those that have died in faith that never saw the promise. Back in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, look what he says. These, the, the hall of faith, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. And, and, and even though they didn't, they, they didn't receive all the promises, they embraced them. And look what they confessed, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We are from another world. Yeah, I know. Unbelievers say, yeah, you got that right. You guys are from Pluto. Listen, you watch the news, don't you? Some of you more than others. You watch the news. What are you holding on to? What are you hoping for? Are you, wait, I, I know what it is. I know what it is. You're looking for the next election. Yep, two years, baby. The next election. You know why? Because things are going to get better. Yep. Everyone's going to have money coming out of their pockets, you know? Everybody's going to have money coming out of their pockets. No. All of your college debts will be paid off. Free medical. Free food. Look, that's Fantasy Island. The plane, the plane. That's Fantasy Island. This, this world is full of injustice. And we are only temporary inhabitants of it. Matt and I were talking this week, and I know this is going to break some of your hearts, but America is not the last great hope for mankind. Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind. And Paul says, this is what it means to be a man or a woman of God. Flee, continually flee, continually pursue, continually fight. And once and for all, lay hold of. And so verse 11 and verse 12 Give us, and we're going to scoot through these other ones really quickly, but listen, verse 11 and verse 12, give us the character of the man of God. 
Verse 13 to 16 now give us a charge or a challenge relative to those things. Verse 13, he says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. I'm charging you, Timothy. Now listen, don't lose your sight here, folks, of where we are in time, where this church is. Paul says, I am charging you, Timothy, even though Nero is murdering Christians and burning them on the cross, even though Nero is skinning Christians alive and feeding them to the lions in the arenas, <clears throat> even though Rome is in a couple of years going to surround Jerusalem and destroy Jerusalem, He says, I am charging you in front, verse 13, I am charging you in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. I am charging you in front of the one who gives life to everything. And not only does he give life, he sustains life, he preserves life. And then he says, and before Jesus Christ, who gave a good testimony before Pontius Pilate, why? Well, in John chapter 18, what was that testimony? In John chapter 18, look at verse 36. And Jesus, look here, this goes along with the theme we were just talking about. And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that it should be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. He says in John chapter 19 in verse 11, Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power at all against me. Pilate, you have no power over me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. He's saying, Timothy, remember, Timothy, Jesus Christ, the, the author and the finisher of our faith, he stood in front of human a human being, he stood in front of Pilate. Listen to this. He stood in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who told Jesus that he had power over his life. Pontius Pilate told Jesus, I have power over your life. Well, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So here Pilate is telling the life that he has power over his life. Jesus said, you couldn't touch me unless the Father in heaven allows you to do that. And Timothy, Timothy, this is the testimony that you and I have to have. You have to remember the one who quickeneth all things. You have to remember the one who is the origin of life, Timothy. And also the author and the finisher of our faith, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And how he stood in front of Roman authorities who were, who were over everyone in the, Ro the Roman world. Power over everyone. He stood in front of the Roman, the Roman authority. And he said, you have zero power over my life. Here's why. Because I'm not of this world. And you have no power over that life. Now here's the exhortation for you and I. How long will it be, folks? Please listen. How long will it be before we find ourselves in those types of circumstances? Where we find ourselves being confronted. Hey, if I go to prison, I sure hope there are some good cooks that go to prison at the same time. How long is it going to be till we find ourselves in a similar predicament? I want you to know this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know why? Because we're not of this world. We're not of this world. There is no earthly power, no earthly power that has power over that life. None. 
Zero. Not even Donald Trump. Because the origin of that life is God. And our example right here given to us tonight or this morning, our example was the one who stood before Pilate and said, my kingdom is not of this world. And you have no authority over me unless my God, the one above me, gives you authority. I give you this charge, Timothy, in the sight of God, who quickeneth, who makes all things alive. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Verse 14, in the first part of verse 15, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Timothy, you keep this commandment, look here, until the appearing, epiphanio, epiphanio, epiphany. First and second Thessalonians was already written long before this. Timothy understands that. He understands that theology that was written to first and second to the Corinth Christians at first and second or at Thessalonica. Paul spent three weeks there and wrote to them about nothing but the end of times. This was written, those books were written long before this. Timothy understood that. He knew that theology. Timothy knows the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Timothy knows the difference between the rapture of the church and the return of Christ to earth to, for the battle of Armageddon and to set up his kingdom. He knows the difference between that. He knows about the Antichrist. He knows about the deception that's come upon the world. That's going to come upon the world. Timothy knows all about this, and he says, Timothy, you keep this commandment until, look, until the appearing, the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ until he expected it in his day. He thought it was going to happen in his day. That's how he lived his life. Do we live with an expected return of Christ? He expected it. Timothy, you keep this commandment until he thought it was going to happen. Do we live with an expected return? Does what we believe about Christ's return determine how we live? If we believe that, then Paul says you should be fleeing these things that would drown men in destruction and perdition, and you should be constantly pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. You should be in the contest. You should be in that fight. It's the good fight. Folks, there's a lost world out there and they're going to hell without hope and that's the species that we're fighting to save and to do that paul says we have to we have to lay hold of something this this world does not have hold of and the charge we get timothy this charge it comes from the one who is, from the, who is the source of all of our life, all of life. It's from his son who stood before the powers of this world and said, you have no power over me. I'm from another kingdom. And we should keep this charge, Paul says in verse 14, without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Folks, when he comes, he is going to show who is the blessed and only potentate. Right now, there are a lot of, potent, a lot of little potentates right now. But when he comes, they will be gone, and he will show there is only one. Verse 16 says, who hath, only hath immortality? Who alone has, look here, deathlessness? <laughs> immortality, deathlessness. 
dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Paul would have understood that, huh, on Damascus Road? Whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. He alone has deathlessness. He's coming with deathlessness. He, he appears in unapproachable light. Paul understood that as he was on the Damascus road, and he said a, a light from heaven shone far above, far greater, far brighter than the, than the noonday sun in the Middle East. The noonday sun in the Middle East is bright. It made that look like a solar eclipse. This is a great challenge for us at the end of this letter. Great challenge. Things that we need to run away from. Things we need to run after, continually run after. And those things that we are to continually run after, folks, they're unnatural for us to run after. And Paul says, you want to be a godly man? You want to be a godly woman? Here's your prescription. Is it easy? Nope. Agonizo. It's not easy. It's agonizing. It's a fight. Present imperative. You must continually flee. You must continually pursue. And then once and for all, Timothy... Once and for all, take hold of eternal life and live the life that is from another world. You stand with me this morning. Father, what a challenge for believers this morning. Paul says, you want to be a godly man? You want to be a godly woman? You want to live a life that pleases God? There are things in your life that you must continually, constantly run away from. Things that would drown men in, in, in perdition. Things that would gouge your eyes out. And you must continually pursue Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Continually pursue. And then lay a hold of, once and for all, eternal life. And I charge you, Timothy, before the author of all of life and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who stood before the greatest power on earth of his day and said you have no power over me because my kingdom is not of this earth what a challenge for us to run away from the things that that are weighing us down and run to the things of godlessness and righteousness what a challenge for us i pray this morning if there's any one of us here today that applies to lord who'd come running right now we can come to this altar or we can come to you right where we stand. You understand our struggles, our battles, our infirmities, things that plague us and the weigh us down. And yet, Lord, none of those things, they may seem weighty to us, none of those things are too big for you. Thank you for speaking to us today.